Nobody could have predicted how the last 18 months were going to go. But with music about loneliness and isolation and the big questions asked in our national anthem, choral ensemble Conspirare came pretty close with their album, The Singing Guitar. I'm Colleen Phelps, and today on Behind the Playlist, a few words from Conspirare's artistic director, Craig Hella Johnson. Hi, Craig. Hey there. How are you, Colleen? Great to see you. Good to see you. So the singing guitar, this is not your ordinary album. <laughs> Why guitar? Right. Well, you know, it has kind of a long history. I won't go into the whole of it, but I mean, the simple part of the history is just that there was a time when I'd gone to a woman, Kathy Panoff, who is uh, in charge of Texas Performing Arts, a big presenting series in Austin at the University of Texas. There, we were going to collaborate on something we wanted to kind of be a big project. And I had pitched her the idea of something um, with antiphonal choirs of guitar, you know. I, and initially I thought, you know, kind of playing a, with a modern version of sort of something with choir singers and guitars, uh, like we were in St. Mark's in Venice, but a, a new kind of choral antiphonal play, um, just as a way to play with texture. And guitar, I think I was interested in just because, well, lots of because, but particularly living right in the heart of Texas too. I mean, the guitar is sort of a symbol for, you know, so much, uh, you know, accurately or not of, of what, you know, Texas is and means, um, especially in central Texas where we live and, um, and guitar use, used in all kinds of ways. So for me, just the, the, I'm fascinated with the connection that people feel with the guitar. I love the sounds and the, the timbre. Um, and uh, so I thought we could play with it. It was also felt like a fun challenge because it is incredible balance challenge, as you can imagine, um, with voices. Even just eight voices can easily overbalance uh, a couple of guitars, acoustically speaking. Um, so anyway, lots of fun reasons, but that's where it started. And then it, it morphed once we got to the time of actually talking to Nico about this commission. Uh, it ended up being three guitar quartets, which felt choir enough to me to, you know, to play with. And um, yeah, he was really intrigued by the idea. And then he went off to search for some texts and the rest is history, I guess. Can you go a little more into the logistics of having that many guitars with a choir? Because I think of instruments overbalancing voices most often. Yeah, certainly. In almost all other cases, um, that's true. But with guitars, um, when they're just acoustic, of course, and so most of, you know, most guitarists and classical guitarists in this kind of setting will amplify too. So, yeah, um, it was it was enormously um, kind of appealing experience all the way through a happy experience and also challenging, you know. Uh, we had fantastic players, obviously the Los Angeles Guitar Quartet is, you know, top of the row world-class players um you know frankly as are members of the austin quartet and texas guitar quartet too um but the los angeles quartet is so well known and you know almost to a person when we first started rehearsing this the guitarists would come up kind of one by one with an initial sort of um kind of almost an apology like hey we don't work with conductors often um you know meaning we don't look up at all <laughs> You know, we're, we're looking down here. And so, uh, you know, and they really couldn't have been nicer about it. And, and they said, but we're going to, we're going to be, you know, looking for you and looking for your beat. And, uh, but there is that aspect of sort of when the downbeat occurs, because the guitar is so fast speaking, it speaks like boom. And the voice kind of finding that onset is not quite as fast. And so there's, you know, um, uh, I often say, you know, initially, just as we was, we had to sort of struggle a little bit at first to find the bottom of the beat together. It was like these beautiful little golden toothpicks kind of falling on the floor, you know, um, kind of having to chase them. And um, but everyone was really re responsive, and we found our way uh, in the end to some really satisfying experiences.
When the Guitar by Rena Ismail is a response to loneliness. Nico Muley's How Little You Are is about the loneliness of pioneer life and missing your loved ones. And then The Dawn's Early Light by Kyle Smith reflects on the question in our national anthem. It was a 2020 album. So surely planned and produced and recorded pre-pandemic. Did it surprise you with how prophetic it ended up being? Hmm. You know, um, it's interesting. It, it, the timing was fascinating. Um, the, the melancholic aspects of those texts that you just described um, seem to fit into kind of a sense of longing and yearning, of course, that um, and a sense of space. And, and distance that, you know, has been such a part of this pandemic here. So yeah, it was a, a surprise about the timing. It just, they're, they're f fascinating texts. I think the guitar also inspires that quality. You know, I mean, we think about those sort of folk song, folk song set, settings, which are actually like laments that, that speak of the heart's longing for for, for one far away, or, you know, you could think of uh, easily 10 different examples of, of things where the guitar is the, the voice of the heart, really, in a way. And um, so I do love that about it. It is a, it's a quiet kind of spacious experience in, the, in Nico's piece, particularly. And I think a listener has to really be able to be quiet and kind of get grounded to take in the whole of that. It's not a, you know, pop it in when you've got 20 minutes after work and before you put the kids to bed or something, you know, it's, it, it involves some space for receiving and absorbing. Um, but it's one of its unique qualities, I think, for sure. Your composition, The Song I Came to Sing, sets a poem by Rabindranath Tagore, which includes the idea that we all have a metaphorical song to sing and we're all seeking it. Can you talk a little bit about how you put that longing into the music? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the only piece on the CD that doesn't include guitar, because um, initially it was it was the first piece on the program. And because this was a very special project that we with these big commissions too, I wanted the piece to also set up sort of the ears, if you will, sort of longing to sort of hear more, to kind of take more in. So part of that is set up just by that lonely kind of achy cello, that ostinato, that pattern that just keeps repeating. Um, sort of had this lilt uh, to it. And um, and just the treble voices. It's such a beautiful poem. I mean, I love Tagore always anyway, but um, yeah, it, it was, it's very much meant to be about that, um, that yearning to fulfill one's life purpose and to even know what it is, that sort of what is the song in my heart? What is that song that I'm yearning to uh, fulfill? And um, so I think in the voices, there were some, some sort of long, it's almost chant-like in the way that I treated it. So it was meant to kind of have a slightly folk, slightly ancient feel kind of merging. And I think um, it was or those kind of aspects of that simple setting that I was trying to uh, set up that picture of longing kind of with the spaciousness of it. How has the meaning of this set of pieces evolved for you since the world turned upside down or even what you hope people will take away from it now versus before. Yeah. Well, one thing I do sense is that people may have more space um, after this year, just because there was so much slowing down, you know, on so many fronts. And so I think slowing down our inner rhythms and how we hear things um, that happened really. And so I do feel like people might be, you know, more available to kind of hear this, which is cool. Um, and I think, uh, well, with everything that's happened this year, not, not just pandemic, but cer certainly since George Floyd died, and now in the very recent days with, you know, the Asian American Pacific Islander community to really uh, coming under such sort of violent attacks and, and then living with so much fear. You know, I think we have, hopefully we are all tuning in much more in a refined way to what this means for so many people and, and how much we need to tune into 
to paying attention and, and making changes, all of us, so that we, so people aren't living with this sense of fear and exclusion. But certainly Kyle's piece, um, The Dawn's Early Light, written by, you know, the, these texts that are inspired or by even Sarah Winnemucca, uh, first known woman, Native American, to be published in English. Uh, I think her text and then his new setting of the national anthem even just is, is, is timed well right now, just as we are rethinking so many things during this time of so many things being upended that perspective, um, even the telling of, of the story of how that leads up to the national anthem in Kyle's piece um, tells a piece of our historical past, which is relevant in this time of consideration of kind of all people's belonging here. The vision statement for Conspirare says that one of the ensemble's goals is, and it's kind of a list, transform lives, open hearts, transcend human and cultural differences, elevate and mobile and heal the human spirit, bring people together, enjoy humanity and peace. How can music do that? Mm. Well, you know, it's interesting, Colin, because I, I think we came at that not because we wanted to try and like push music to a place where it hadn't been, but we're just all of us, you know, and uh, as the founder and artistic director too, just knowing my own experiences with music, knowing its transformational power in my own life, and then hearing stories that abound from many of our early members and then around the world. I mean, you just talk to people in the, the, the place that music holds. So we're basically just saying, we wanna be here to be a conduit to allow music to do what it does. And I think, it's it's also a way we can kind of love our world uh, with the thing that we do. If you're a bricklayer, you know, you try and love the world in your work that way. If you're a parent, you know, no matter how many roles that we all play, but we are musicians and we want to put our music out there to say we also embrace the possibility that this could also support the world's awakening and could care for people and transform them. How it does that is sort of not our business, you know, because that's very personal for every single individual. But we just know that music does do that. And we just want to bring that sensationality to it. So, gosh, and it does it by changing our perspective very often. You know, um, we could probably talk for hours and hours just referencing, say, a piece of music like this or like any example um, that has the possibility where two speeches or a debate or a, a newspaper headline um, might not have impact to change and yet a piece of music which can affect our physical experience it can it can trigger memories it can provoke uh, shifts of perspective like nothing else um, and it's that shift of perspective from which then we make changes and shifts in our lives you know and so it's kind of an amazing thing we get to traffic in, isn't it? Throughout your catalog, Conspirari seems to have found a middle ground between recording and performing newer and I would say old-ish pieces of music. What do you prioritize when you decide what's next? 
Yeah. Well, it's such a great question. I wish there were a simple answer, but um, we do kind of straddle that line because we're totally devoted to new music. And so that's kind of where I feel like um, a big part of our heart is. And yet almost equally, there's a foot in uh, what we might call more traditional repertoire or in more known repertoire. I think the thing we love, and I personally love too, is sort of being a shuttle diplomat between both. Not that they're sort of two <laughs> separate exact you know, groups because they merge uh, and it's part of a procession. But I think this, this whole notion of, uh, you know, it, you've probably met people too, but I've met many people who are just dyed in the wool. I'm a Baroque listener. I don't listen to anything else or I only like new music. And that's, and you know, somehow to me that, was not my path and didn't feel quite satisfying. I wanted to sort of dance across the spectrum. And sometimes I joke with our with our singers that, you know, part of our recording work is is even selfish in a sense of, you know, when we're all in our senior apartments or assisted living or nursing homes or whatever, I want to have a really great broad CD collection, you know, made with musicians and friends whom I love. And that we can look back and say, we experienced all that. And now let's just hear it and receive it. And in a way, that's how I think about the offering to the world. We don't do anything sort of very much in sort of what I would say an academic way to, you know, um, it's much more sort of feeling into what we feel called to do next. What's the next project? Um, and there's always a combination of just music that simply inspires us combined with where are we in the world, you know, because what we do is never apart from the world. Yeah. The overwhelming majority of the world's choral singers have taken about a year off. Speaking on a fairly concrete level, pretty practically, what are some things you would suggest individual singers do to prepare their voices to come back to choral singing? Yeah, good. <laughs> sing, sing, sing. You know, it just like use that muscle, right? Um, so I do. And we've been talking to some of our singers too, just like get singing again and find a way to kind of allow it to be a regular practice whilst, you know, you're still not singing. Cause it's something, you know, cause we'll do six hour rehearsals. Um, I mean, three, two, three hour rehearsals on a day. And then maybe even a little outreach thing in the winds. It's, that's a big sing. And then if you do it four days in a row, five days in a row, it is as, you know, per your question singing and i also think you know there's a mental there's a practical aspect of just getting back in the game mentally um to really you know re-envisioning remembering who who they are who, how, what they are built for what they're purposed for what their beautiful gifts are meant to be used in what ways so um but i do think um you know, and for, for me, if someone, if we're going to walk in the office and say, let's, you know, let's work with, I would say anything that supports kind of finding that the evenness from the top to the bottom of the register again, you know, just work so that, and, and the breath is ultimately the teacher, right? As always. So the breath, you, everybody carries in their own great masterclass with that breath, masterclass teacher. Uh, and the breath just allows one to say, how do I work through all parts of the voice with the breath? Uh, uh, what kinds of exercises are are useful for that individual singer to be going up and down in the register and really kind of rebuilding the strength? Because mostly I think it's a matter of endurance. Because what I do find among singers that I've been talking with is um, that there's actually a beauty and a luster to the voices right now that I'm hearing because they've been they've been able to rest. So you know they're they're good for that first. 20 minutes, 30 minutes. <laughs> and then I just know the endurance kind of wears down a little bit. Further, what would you recommend a choir director plan to focus on to do a healthy return? I mean, the, my very first thought going to about that is to, to remember what these human beings have just been through and even what they've been through that they may not even know they've been through because there's there are so many emotional layers of of kind of weight and burden right now that this has been a psych, kind of psychically very burdensome time and many people are very aware of that and others are sort of not even aware. so just, just remembering the human beings you're dealing with welcoming them back in you know having you know trying to answer this very practical question you're saying being very intentional not just you know 
going back to how it was or let's go back to normal that phrase doesn't mean a lot to me uh i don't think we're going to go back to the old normal i think we're going to we all we all need to be kind of humbled by this and say or i'll just say that, that i have been very humbled by this to say i i need to ask really freshly like the first rehearsal the first concert series um, because it's both for singers and for audiences alike people are nervous to sit next to each other you know shoulder to shoulder again and uh, but i do think um and i think it's going to be for or different for every individual conductor and choir but it seems to me that some mix of you know some things that feel like home in in the voice and in the body repertoire wise and then some things that really tap into the time um and then other than that it's just get get back singing start using the muscle again start using the ear again you know refresh i think it's going to be fascinating you know we i don't quite know when that time is quite yet <laughs> and i don't think many do exactly i mean we're all kind of think and fall is it but you know well we'll, we'll see so you sort of touched on this a little bit but the choral community is probably going to rebuild itself in the next year or so what would you like to see evolve? You said you don't want us to come back exactly the same as we were before. What would you like to see evolve during this reset in the world of choral music? We have to reestablish, you know, so those of us who have kind of grown up in musical training, you know, reference the canon at times. And, you know, and I had a wonderfully thoughtful friend who's saying, what exactly is the canon anyway? I mean, it was a really honest question when we talk about music. But I think, you know, this, this repertoire that has been sort of, traditionally thought of as the tried and true and that which will endure and, you know, has endured the test of time. And I think we're all needing to really question what that even means. It's, it's lost some of its um, potential to, to stand because of all the people it did not include. And I think we're waking up to that more and more. Um, and so I, I mean, that's one thing that's interesting to me is could we, could we refresh, you know, we're not needing to throw things out that are, you know, wonderful pieces of music and that we, which we cherish and love and admire. Um, but it's really opening up the door to so much more considering, you know, that. So, I mean, that's one thing, just thinking about that. I hope that we're all just a whole, certainly as a human race, but also in the choral world, just kinder to each other, really more more enthusiastic about everyone's singing participation. And um, I, I hope also that we will encourage individual artistry within this profession, because it, it within our trade, you know, it's tended to be a lot of sort of paying forward, you know, we, we receive the last generation sort of um, repertoire and formats for programs and, you know, and that's often how things work, you get passed down from the, that previous. And yet I think we've done that in choral music in such a way that has sometimes become stale. And I would just love to see choral conductors and leaders and shapers in these organizations really have more courage to offer things, unique things from their own perspective as conduits of their own kind of inner selves. You know, how do they see, or we see this so much more in dance, you know, with some of the modern choreographers and. Um, and I'd love to see more of that in choral music rather than less. Yeah. The singing guitar is available wherever you get music. And tune in to hear some of these pieces on 90.5 WUOL Classical Louisville.